Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the webinar, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking several partners for helping to make this webinar uh, possible, including the Minnesota Department of Health and our local community partners, including statewide health improvement partnership grantees. Our webinar today builds off of the Public Health Law Center's work with local Minnesota communities and SHIP grantees, our work in Kansas and other states around local agriculture and gardening efforts. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Leoma Van Dort, and I'm a policy analyst at the Public Health Law Center, and I'll be a moderator for today. Currently, I'm working on a national project led by the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems and the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity to elevate local laws that promote access to healthy food. I also support the center's work in Kansas to promote public health objectives around food systems, land use, and community use of school property. And here is a photograph of what it actually looks like in St. Paul, Minnesota today. Um, and I'm sure most of you have a similar view when you look outside your windows with blizzards and snowstorms. So really, thank you all for joining us today on this cold and snowy afternoon. Um, we are uh, hopeful, though, um, that in a few weeks we will have a little bit of sunshine and green and fruits and flowers again, uh, which is why we are also super excited about our webinar uh, on community gardens today. Um, so before we dive in, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the Public Health Law Center. We are a nonprofit policy organization based at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Our work, uh, our work focuses on supporting community states um, and federal efforts around the country to use local law and policy to address chronic health issues impacting our communities as a result of tobacco use lack of access to healthy food, and lack of opportunities to be physically active. The Public Health Law Center helps create communities where everyone can be healthy. Um, we provide legal technical assistance, including legal research, policy development, implementation, and defense. Uh, we provide um, and develop publications and trainings. However, we do not provide direct representation or lobby. Um, so through our webinar today, we hope to help you understand the benefits of community gardens, identify how local policies can support successful gardening efforts, and also highlight how local community gardens have worked with local laws and policies to create vibrant community gardens in Minnesota. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Mary Marrow is a senior staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center. Mary works with local communities around the United States to support efforts to increase healthy eating and active living. She is very excited about the opportunity to support community gardening efforts as she is an avid gardener herself. With several years of gardening in the Sabatini Community Garden in Minneapolis and as a backyard gardener, Mary is also a Hennepin County Master Gardener. Um, and next, we also have presenting on our webinar, Erica Itzel, founder and co-coordinator of the Heart and Soil Community Gardens in Mankato. Erica brings the important values of conservation, connection, and respect for the earth to the community gardens and helps foster connections between community members through gardening. Erica is also actively involved in Transition Mankato. She's a member of the Advisory Council for the Center for Earth Spirituality and Rural Ministry. She volunteers with Blue Earth County Farm and teaches cooking classes at the St. Peter Food Co-op. So before I turn things over to Mary, I'd like to provide some background to our discussion on community gardens and talk about what a community garden is. So it is any piece of land where plants are grown and maintained by a group of community members. Now, community gardens may be established for a number of reasons. To produce food for individual consumption or for sale. They can be designed for beautification of the community, or they can be used for educational purposes. 
And regardless of why community gardens are established, we know that they provide important social and health benefits, environmental and economic benefits, in addition to creating opportunities for local food production. For example, community gardens help increase access to healthy food. Um, they enable you to grow seasonal and culturally appropriate food, thereby supporting food security. Gardening also encourages people to spend time outdoors and to be physically active. And then the community garden space actually becomes a place where people come together to build connections, and there's a sense of um, community identity and a sense of pride and accomplishment um, that comes out of community gardening. And then there's also a special um, benefit for certain groups, such as uh, neighborhood youth, immigrant families, individuals with disabilities, and the formerly incarcerated because community gardens provide opportunities for them to find supplemental income and to be involved in skills development and workforce training. Um, they also encourage healthier food environments in places that incorporate community gardening practices like in schools, in childcare centers, in hospitals, and work sites. And community gardens benefit the environment, and they also increase property values of surrounding communities. So what we also need to understand is that community gardens are not just about neighborhood residents coming together to grow food. There are many groups and players involved, and there is a dynamic relationship between these various groups. Um, the Iowa Food Systems Council uses a socio-ecological model in their 2012 Growing Solutions publication to talk about a system of linkages in food gardening. And as you can see in this image, this model shows the connection between individuals and households, organizations and communities, and local, state, and federal laws and policies, and how all of these components come together to coordinate efforts to grow food and influence attitudes, and also to increase knowledge and change behaviors around growing food, and especially how public policy has a big impact over the entire process. Um, and community gardening is not a new phenomenon. In the United States, people have been gardening in cities and towns for over 200 years, and local gardening efforts have evolved over these years. Um, before the First World War, we see how people kept home gardens, mostly for subsistence. But leading up to the First World War, during the period of rapid urbanization, we saw people turning to commercial food production, and gardens were seen as a way to teach agricultural skills to a growing urban population. And then during the First World War and after, there were several gardening programs funded by the government, especially during the Great Depression. And in 1943, that's during the Second World War, the Twin Cities alone had over 130,000 gardeners out of 20 million nationwide. And even though after the Second World War, the federal government withdrew support for wartime gardening programs, we did see a re-emergence of community gardening and urban agriculture as a grassroots effort. And after the 1980s and today, community gardening has re-emerged as a way to promote healthy eating, uh, physical activity, and food security in local communities. So how can local communities come together to address challenges around creating and sustaining community gardens, and how do they work together to find solutions? Well, one of the most important things communities should do before starting a garden is to form a team to gather information about their communities. Information like um, community demographics, the availability of land in the area, um, the median income by neighborhood, locations of retail food options. Now, all of this is very important information to learn about the needs and interests of fellow residents and to identify any barriers and opportunities so that they can make the case to policymakers. And this is what we call a community needs assessment. It's also important to explicitly and intentionally consider social justice and equity in the process. For example, it's very important to include 
community residents in decision making about gardening to ensure economic development goals meet the needs of the community and do not, for example, displace lower income residents uh, or negatively impact their ability to access resources. It's also important to build support for a garden by getting people to be actively involved in the planning and implementation process. And it's important to keep everyone informed about what's going on because this creates a sense of ownership among gardeners. And your garden is more likely to be successful when community members are actively engaged in this process. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Mary to talk uh, about the upcoming Community Garden Policy Reference Guide and how it can be used to navigate potential legal and policy issues related to community gardens. Over to you, Mary. Great. Thanks so much, Leoma. And so I am really um, excited to announce our forthcoming Community Garden Policy Reference Guide and to um, provide you with just a general overview of the guide and information um, that hopefully will help support your efforts in promoting and growing your community gardens wherever you are in the country. So the Community Garden Policy Reference Guide is, is not quite um, on our website yet. We should have it up in the next few days, and everyone that's on this webinar or who has registered for the webinar will receive a link and an announcement when it is made available publicly. But just to give you kind of a preview, the, the way that we've organized the, the guide is really focused on how one might approach a garden from just conceptualizing and starting a garden, you know, talking about some of the policy opportunities that Leoma was just mentioning with a community gardens needs assessment and community engagement and public participation process, all the way through how, you know, the, the steps of when you're actually harvesting or, um, you know, reaping the benefits of your garden efforts. So before um, I get into it too much, I wanted to just acknowledge the group of people that have been really involved in helping to develop this um, guide. Anna Larson um, is a new sector fellow and policy analyst with the center for about a year and a half, and she um, has moved on to more um, exciting things right now, but she was just really a great um, resource in helping to develop the guide and doing a lot of the background research and writing. And then we also have this great team of research assistants who have also been involved in um, helping to develop the guide, and I wanted to just make sure to acknowledge all of their efforts as um, it really has been a team effort. So one of the questions that might come up is why a policy focus? And one of the things I think that the social ecological model that Leoma mentioned earlier you know, does a nice job of showing is just the continuum of, of ways that um, in a community different individuals, organizations, businesses, and policy all work together for the success of a community effort like a community garden. And, um, and local and state laws and policies can impact the success of community gardens throughout the life of a garden. And um, one of the things that I do here in my work at the Public Health Law Center is I um, work with a lot of community organizations and people that are trying to develop and implement different healthy eating and physical activity initiatives. And there is a really high level of interest in community gardens. I think it's a really nice way for people to come together and, and work together to promote the vibrancy of their community and do something that just feels meaningful at a very local scale. And we get a lot of questions from people about, well, how do, say, different local laws impact um, this gardening effort? And so um, in developing this guide, we've really been informed from a lot of the technical assistance questions that we've received, working with a local community garden organization, Gardening Matters, and other advocates around the state who um, are really committed to this um, gardening movement but also um, have encountered legal and policy challenges along the way. So the guide is developed around these different steps of, uh, of starting and um, implementing a garden. And I'm going to go through these and try to highlight some of the key policy considerations that might come up. And I just wanted to note that the guide does provide specific examples and citations for different communities around the country who have use local policies to support and enhance community gardens. And one thing that I, I want to note is that as part of our work and our research, 
it really has been striking to me the range of different communities who have um, in local governments who have developed policies to support community gardening efforts in a, a whole host of ways. And it, it really, I think, indicates that how um, the enthusiasm and just the grassroots nature of these gardens. And, and I've seen from very rural communities to very large communities in Minnesota, around the country, who are actually really um, responding to community need and advocacy to support gardens. So I just want to encourage you to think that it isn't a one-size-fits-all, that different communities may have different models or different approaches, but there are a host of ways, regardless of your community size, where you can support gardening efforts. So in thinking about one of the first steps of a garden is you know, finding out like how do you develop, maintain, and sustain a community garden. It's really good to think about this, you know, at the very early stages for the long-term success of the garden. And these are three key areas that we've identified where um, there are policy opportunities for local governments to um, support these garden efforts. So, for example, in um, local government support for, lo for, for community gardens, we've seen that some um, local governments actually have passed a resolution in support of community gardens, have um, named a certain day of the month or even a month as community garden day or month, and really provided leadership and, and support at a very high level of government, indicating how important these community gardening efforts are to the community as a whole. And I know, like, for one example, in St. Paul, Minnesota, that there's been a you know, declaration of a community garden day and a resolution passed in support of community gardens. In addition, some local governments also um, have a, um, developed resource lists and technical assistance um, resources specifically for community gardens to provide um, more support for community garden efforts and have this information on their municipal website. And so I know that um, Madison and Dane County in Wisconsin has done this and um, have some really great resources there. Another way that local governments can provide support through a policy approach is to provide access to garden seals training or other public resources. And so you can see this through some public-private partnerships where you may have, say, a public garden on, on public park property, but then, say, ex the extension services, master gardeners may provide uh, um, technical assistance support in partnership with the local government. Another thing that I've seen is some municipalities provide specific technical information and garden information on their municipal website, as I mentioned before, but some, some governments have actually provided that information in multiple languages in response to the immigrant community that may be really interested in gardening resources but may not have as much access to gardening information as other communities. And um, a community where we've seen this is in Maplewood, Minnesota. Of course, the question comes up about funding and how um, you can actually get the, the financial support for a garden. And, and I will say that, you know, that um, financial support for gardens can come from actual monetary donations, but also in-kind donations from local businesses um, have also been a really important resource for gardening efforts. But we've seen um, in different uh, uh, policy efforts is public-private partnerships, so there have been some efforts between, say, local departments of public health and um, different churches or community groups to bring different resources together to promote um, public gardens. Uh, the Neighborhood Revitalization Program funding has been used, I know, in Minneapolis to support, um, I think it was the Dowling Community Garden, which was a victory garden um, from World War II that is still um, in operation today. Um, and another really interesting approach to funding gardens from a local perspective is through a participatory budgeting approach. And this is something that um, I believe a community in Vallejo, California, actually um, has allowed for some community involvement in allocating different funds for community projects. And through a community participation um, effort, um, the community decided that they really wanted to get, dedicate funds from the participatory budgeting um, process to community gardens. And then there are a lot of other approaches to funding that local governments can support 
neighborhood matching funds. Um, there's some bond funds, I think, that Seattle, Washington has allocated for community gardens and a whole host of other ways that local governments can support and fund community gardens. Then probably you know, moving to the question of land access is, is probably one of the biggest issues that gardeners, especially new gardeners, are concerned with but it also can impact um, existing gardens that um, may be facing um, shortened lease terms or development pressures for their gardens. And there's a lot of things that local governments can do to help support and sustain um, new and existing gardens through a policy lens. So I'm going to just review some of these quickly. Uh, local land use plans is a really important way for a, uh, a government to really make a commitment up front about how they see the community, community's evolution and development and that community gardens and green space is really a fundamental priority and goal for the, for the, um, for the community. And I know here in Minnesota there are a lot of efforts going on in the Twin Cities metro area and around the state around updating and revising comprehensive plans. And I know that um, a lot of local advocates are working to incorporate a commitment to green space and gardening efforts as part of their planning efforts. There are other kinds of local plans where um, communities can really include a, a commitment to green space and gardens. Uh, there are open area plans, um, subdivision plans, and others. And in the guide, we really highlight several examples of communities that have actually done this. Burlington, Vermont, Tower, Minnesota, um, a number of Ed Edmonds, Washington, a number of places around the, the country have used land use plans as a way to support um, community gardening. gardening. And then closely related to the planning efforts are the, um, the local zoning efforts. And, and zoning is really where the, um, I think the rubber meets the road and, and where land use planning takes on a life and where there's enforcement and implementation of a plan. And so um, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in communities in the use of zoning as a tool to promote greening green space, open space, and gardening efforts. And this is just kind of a list of some examples of, of ways that we've seen different local governments use zoning as a policy tool to um, promote and support community gardens. So there's different zoning techniques such as residential cluster development zones or open space zoning designation that can be used to ensure that um, neighborhoods have green space available to them for community gardening efforts. Um, there are communities who have revised their local zoning codes to make sure that, for example, community gardens are allowed on public property or in parkland. Um, also, just really ensuring that, that even with development pressures, that green space is preserved in, in, even in commercial zoning areas or other places where um, people may not always think that there could be land for a garden. And then, um, and then you know, establishing different other zoning designations for community gardens. But there's a lot of things, um, there, there's a number of examples that are included in the guide. And again, this is where the range of communities that are using zoning techniques to support community gardens is really quite striking. And we've identified policies in Bloomington, Indiana, Belding, Michigan, Cleveland, Ohio, Boston, Massachusetts, all over the country in all sizes of communities that have used zoning as a tool to support gardens. I did want to just bring to your attention a really great resource that's uh, been maybe, I think was released last year. The Minnesota Food Charter Initiative has created this food access planning guide with, um, I think it was Blue Cross Blue Shield Center for Prevention and a number of partners around the state of Minnesota to provide some um, sample plan and zoning language for cities to use to support um, access to healthy food. And while the, the guide includes a wide range of food access issues, there are some, there's some really great examples of planning and zoning language specifically geared towards urban agriculture and community gardening efforts. And so I would just encourage you to take a look at that because it's really a practical tool that I think is, is presented in a way that's in kind of planner speak 
and um, it's something that is meant to really be used proactively um, by partnerships between um, gardening advocates, public health, and local government. There's also a lot of places to find land for community gardens, and I'm going to just review a few of the key ways that gardeners have identified land or found land and where there are policy opportunities for that. So public land, parkland or other public land is a clear place where community gardeners often look for access to land, and this requires working with the local government and, and possibly some policy um, development to make this um, a viable option. So some communities may not have a specific policy around the use of public parkland for gardens, and so it, it might be helpful to um, work with your local government to actually create a policy that specifically either creates um, community gardens in specific park areas or, or lays out some of the parameters about how community members can access parkland for gardening activities. Another really important part of using um, public land is, is having lease terms that support gardening activity. It can take some time to develop a garden, the soil, and, and, it, and it's a real investment and labor of love for gardeners. And so um, having longer leases can really support kind of the commitment and the long-term viability of a garden. There are other you know, public property lots that might be good options for gardens as well, um, vacant lots or tax forfeited property. I know that different gardening efforts have used those those types of properties and worked with their local governments to, to work um, to identify that land. And then a number of communities have also um, created a, an ongoing list of an inventory of land that is available for community gardens and um, makes that publicly available so that gardeners know where the, the land that could be used as a community garden is available. Another place that um, I've been seeing some real interesting developments is in really intentionally thinking about gardening as an opportunity on low income and public housing sites. And so there's some really interesting um, efforts. I've, we've seen some things in Denver, Colorado, and Seattle, Washington, and Minneapolis of collaborations with public housing agencies, local health departments, and other nonprofits to start and maintain community gardens at public housing or low income residential sites. And I just think that this is really important for, um, to make sure you know, from an equity perspective that all um, people in our community have the option of gardening. It is such, a, there are so many benefits to gardening from a health perspective, um, both physical health, mental health, for healthy food access. And, um, and, and it really helps to promote community building and so many other features in a community that we want to make sure that all members of our community have access to that. Um, another way that I've seen community guard, um, another way that I've seen local government support gardens is by creating tax incentives for community gardens by waiving or reducing property taxes um, that are owned or operated by a nonprofit or community garden group. And I've seen some of these efforts in Washington, D.C. has some tax policies that, that waive or reduce the taxes for community gardens. I believe San Francisco has a similar kind of initiative. And I believe that New Jersey has a state law that um, provides some specific tax benefits to community and public garden efforts. And then finally, a really great place to start thinking about land opportunities is through any community or nonprofit organizations. Um, I don't, different communities may have access to land banks or land trusts or different urban agricultural organizations that um, work with the local government to identify and preserve open space and that space can be made available for community gardens. And then also um, different churches and other social service agencies may have property that can be used for a community garden. And this is where really working with the private or nonprofit organization and the local government is important to make sure that, for example, the zoning ordinance or the, the, the zoning um, designation for that private property is, um, can be used for a community garden. And if it is not zoned for garden use, it, it can be, um, Maybe a variance or a conditional use could be um, granted to allow that gardening activity. So once um, land is identified as a potential site for community garden, I don't think that that's actually the end of the conversation about 
land. And this is where, um, as a gardener myself, I know that once you have a plot of land, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great place for gardening. And so really thinking about soil conditions, water access, and sunlight is, is critical for um, the success of a gardening effort. So um, soil conditions is a place where I think is a really good place to start because people oftentimes have questions about any kind of historical land uses or potential contamination, especially in an urban area, a vacant lot, or even like a tax forfeited property that may have some dubious his historical use, um, gardeners should consider what those risks are and try to understand how to proceed. And just because the soil may have had a troubled past doesn't mean that it can't still be used um, as a garden site, but there are different steps that need to be taken if the, the the quality or the contamination of the soil is a concern. And I have seen that some municipalities make information about the historical use of gardens or of different property available to the public, and then some provide low-cost soil testing services to community gardens. And I believe that some um, local governments also, if a community garden site does have contaminated soil, may work with the garden to remediate that soil condition. Water access is another huge concern um, and priority for um, community gardeners, and this is another place where working with the local government can be a really valuable um, partnership to ensure that gardens have the water access that they need. So um, I've seen policies all over um, the country where there are partnerships and local government support in making water available to community gardens. And um, in addition to just making hydrants available or installing meters for gardens, I've also seen some, some local governments that have created specific funds to support community gardens in actually installing the water infrastructure. And some of the places around the country that I've seen um, in, in Minnesota, um, Bird Island, Mora, and Lake Crystal, Minnesota have all passed policies specifically allowing for um, garden access to water and, and providing government support for that. And Baltimore, Baltimore Maryland has also, um, as a larger um, city, um, provided policy support for garden water access. And one area that I, I'm interested in is the idea of sunlight and policies that, policies that might impact access to sunlight for gardens. And for growing vegetables, um, Successfully, you need to have six to 12 hours of sunlight and um, tree coverage, building height, you know, there's a number of things that can impact the, the sunlight that may be, um, that a garden plot may receive. And there are policies that can impact um, whether a garden, whether a garden can maybe take down some trees to provide greater sunlight or whether or not there may be trees that are as part of, say, an urban forestry program that might be planted and as the trees grow could impair some of the sunlight access that the garden may have. Um, I can speak from experience that a, a tree planted today can create a different shade um, situation in 10 to 15 years and it's good to think about those things ahead of time. But this is an area too that um, for any of the people that are on the call, I'd be really interested if any of you have any experience with policies impacting sunlight um, with gardening efforts. I know that um, there's discussions about that and I haven't seen as many policies specifically geared towards this. So if people have any um, experience to share, I'd love to hear about that. So then moving from, so now we have a good plot, we have land, we have the partnership and support that we need to, to make a go of the garden, and now it's time to think about designing a community garden. And I think there's some important considerations with a garden design that can make it more accessible and reflective of the community needs. So um, I, I get questions fairly frequently from community members asking about accessibility requirements for individuals with disabilities or individuals using assistive mobility devices with, with community gardens. And I think that, um, that it is a really good practice to um, make some of the, the community garden plots accessible to individuals with disabilities. And it's also sometimes the location or the, the terrain is not amenable to making the entire garden accessible. But there are some interesting resources that are available and that we highlight in the guide that um, 
provide some guidance in, around making gardens accessible and um, making sure that people throughout the community are able to enjoy them. Other things that can come up from a policy perspective are just different um, policies that impact gardening structures and um, setback requirements. So gardening structures that are common in community gardens can be you know, semi-permanent or permanent gardening structures from raised beds, tool sheds, fences, hoop houses um, for more permanent gardens, possibly even greenhouses. And local ordinances really have an impact on what gardens can and cannot construct. And there might be different health and safety considerations or things that may impact whether or not that's a viable option. So it's a really good idea for a garden to understand what those local policies are before making the investment in building a structure only to find out that there, was, that there is a policy that may impact that. Here in Minnesota, for example, um, hoop houses um, sometimes have to um, the, the, the way uh, hoop houses design has to consider the state building codes snow load requirements. And, and I, I have heard from some gardeners around the state how they have found some creative ways of developing and designing their hoop houses so that they can navigate and meet the snow load requirements but still um, meet, also meet the needs of the community garden. Another area that I, I think that policies can impact a fair amount are signs and fences. Um, both local governments are fairly involved in um, regulating land use, including the where fences can be located, the height of fences, the materials that a fence is built out of, and also the same going with signs as far as the size of signs, um, where it can be located on property. And this is very dependent on your local municipal context, but it's just it's really important that you keep in mind that those um, policies may impact your garden plans. Setback requirements are also another place that um, community gardens can run into some problems as far as um, in some urban areas there may be um, more restrictive setback requirements from the property line or from a, or from a street or sidewalk. That, that even if there is a setback requirement that may be restrictive for a community garden, I also know that community gardens have been able to work with their local government to uh, modify or revise some of their, their um, setback requirements to make community gardens more viable. Then in preparing the garden site, there are some really important considerations from a safety perspective and then also from making sure that your garden is successful and plants can grow. From a, personal, from a personal perspective, I can vouch for the importance of calling before you dig. And this is one of the situations where I, um, in my backyard gardening efforts, um, didn't realize that there was actually an electric line that was um, going underneath where our new rain garden was um, slated to be built. And um, luckily, there, was, it, there wasn't a tragic story with that. But I, I think from my experience digging in my backyard, I can assure you the importance of this law that is a, it's a 50 state law that uh, to call before you dig to make sure that utilities, uh, utilities can come and mark your yard so that you don't inadvertently dig into some utility line and um, either from your own personal safety or from um, damaging the utility itself. And then there are also policies around that impact building healthy soil and equipment use. So building healthy soil is really an important <coughs> consideration for gardens in thinking about what your plants need and how, how to work with compost. I mean, there are different local ordinances that can impact composting from whether or not um, composting is allowed on a community garden site how large the compost um, pile can be, if there's any requirements about the structure of the, gar of the compost, and, um, and then also if there are any state or local restrictions on movement or use of compost, like composted manure or other soil augmentation that um, are often used with gardens. Likewise, there um, may be policies that impact the use of equipment in the garden. So I know that we saw um, an interesting um, example of a municipality that allowed for the use of their rototilling equipment for the, the garden on park property, which is a really great way for the local government, park service, um, and public 
public service department to support gardening efforts because rototilling can be an expense and a challenge for um, gardening efforts. But then at the same time, there may be local ordinances that impact noise restrictions, and so you want to be sensitive to any kind of noise ordinances to be impacting neighbors in using rototillers or small tractors or whatever you may need to use for um, preparing your garden site. So we just have a couple other areas to go over, and then we'll be able to hear from Erica in Mankato about her great efforts with um, her heart and soil community garden. Um, and now we're, so now we're actually to the gardening activities and the use of garden rules as a way to support gardening activities. One thing that I just want to highlight, and I think that Erica will be talking about this some, is just the importance of having a garden agreement and garden rules to make sure that everyone who's using the garden understands what the expectations are and their responsibilities as a gardener. A really important piece that's often included in garden rules are um, restrictions on the use of tobacco and um, policies around the use of chemicals. One thing that I think that is interesting to keep in mind is that tobacco use is not just a public health concern, but also um, tobacco byproducts can be harmful to garden plants as well. So um, restricting the use of tobacco and electronic cigarettes in gardens, I think, is just a, is a good idea for the health of both the garden and the gardeners. Also, using chemicals can be um, a, a bone of contention, and I think it's important that, that people up front know what the garden's policies are around the use of chemicals. Most community gardens that I'm familiar with do have a chemical-free or an organic policy, and um, so it's just as important to make that clear to gardeners. And also to work with your local government. Sometimes there, there have been issues where a local government may um, spray, say, a, a uh, an adjoining parcel of land or a boulevard near a community garden, and then there's drift of the, the herbicide or the pesticide that can really negatively impact the garden activities. And so I think it's really important to you know, work with your local government in creating some policies and understanding about the use of chemicals in and around the garden. Gardens actually also provide a lot of other benefits to um, in addition to the, the growing the vegetables that most gardens do, but beneficial plants can support pollinator health. And also, if there are noxious weeds and invasive plants that are included in a garden, that can really detract from the, um, the attractiveness and the, the, the contribution that the garden makes to the community. And so there are many garden rules, um, include specifications around um, different types of plants that are in, encouraged and plants that are not allowed. And also there may be local government policies specifically around noxious weeds and invasive plants that may impact what can be grown in the garden. And an, an area that I think that there's some growing interest in is whether or not bees can be kept in a community garden. And I've seen some interesting efforts around the country to allow for beekeeping in community gardens as long as certain requirements are met and that there isn't a nuisance or a problem with, with neighbors. And then our, the final area that we wanted, I wanted to touch on briefly has to do with liability issues. And this is an area that comes up often. People have questions about if there are injuries or damages um, associated with uh, garden activities. Waivers and releases is something that is oftentimes gardeners must sign a waiver of liability to participate in the garden. And I believe that Erica has that um, involvement with her heart and soil garden. Um, lease agreements can include specifications about responsibilities um, and um, the obligations of the landowner and the gardener. And then there are ways that local governments can support gardens in accessing liability insurance um, through either including a rider on their um, insurance policy to include um, gardens on public property or um, providing resources for gardeners to find liability insurance if that's required. And this is an example of the um, waiver and release from Heart and Soil. And then the final area of growing, harvesting, and selling, we've finally gotten to what I think most people think of when they're working with gardens is this end result of a, of a fairly involved process, but one that really can um, involve a lot of different community members. And so some of the questions that come up with growing, harvesting, and selling garden produce is, first of all, whether or not um, 
garden produce can be sold. And different communities are kind of experimenting with this idea of making a distinction between a community garden where um, garden produce cannot be sold and a market garden where um, produce can be sold. Uh, other communities include in their, their garden policies um, uh, uh, an encouragement to donate produce from community gardens to local hunger relief and social service agencies. So there's different approaches there. And then an issue that has come up here in Minnesota actually not too long ago is this issue of seed sharing because there were some seed sharing activities that were going on um, with gardeners in Duluth, Minnesota at a library. And then um, the gardeners d learned that there was actually a state law that prohibited seed sharing. And um, the city of Duluth, um, I think, came out in support of um, a seed sharing initiative. And there was an effort with local gardeners and advocates and some of the local city governments with the State Department of Ag to modify um, and, and revise the state law to allow seed sharing for home, educational, charitable, or personal non-commercial use. So there's some kind of surprising ways that um, laws and policies can come up when people aren't expecting it and it can impact the viability of the gardening effort. Now I'm going to turn this over to Erica to talk about all the great work that she's doing in Mankato. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for passing off the, I'd say baton, but maybe the carrot stick to me here uh, this morning or afternoon, I should say, coming to you from a snowy river valley in Mankato, Minnesota, just south of the Twin Cities, to talk about our Heart and Soil Community Gardens effort uh, that we have here in Mankato. So, uh, well, what, what is Heart and Soil? Uh, you can see there that Heart and Soil is a grassroots community-driven garden effort that really focuses in on encouraging locally sourced and accessible healthy food, sustainable gardening education, and then, of course, the piece about the relationships, the heart part, is making connections between community members and neighborhoods throughout Mankato. Uh, go ahead and move this here. Uh, when we looked at Heart and Soil uh, being part of the community gardening efforts in Mankato, uh, it really floated up from a conversation where uh, my partner in life and partner in gardening, my husband who's also the co-coordinator for Heart and Soil, and I had discussed uh, the importance of gardens in our own lives, but also the importance of community connections. We both grew up in neighborhoods where you could go next door and ask for a cup of sugar and you might strike up a conversation with your neighbors and learn about the folks that are around you. And uh, certainly uh, in Minnesota, like most places I would imagine, uh, you talk about the weather, you talk about how things are growing, uh, maybe eventually you get that sugar. Uh, or in the case, so we focus on healthy eating, we want to focus on more like borrowing a cup of kale from someone. So uh, we really highlighted here in the Seeds of Significance kind of what, what it was that we wanted to accomplish with Heart and Soil. And I'll get to, you know, certainly we're not doing this alone, but really strengthening community resiliency. That's an important piece, particularly in Heart and Soil's vision. Uh, wanting to be thoughtful about our food system. And then, of course, beautification of our community and our already beautiful world, but really highlighting uh, the importance of taking care of our planet. Uh, of course, we've talked quite a bit today already about uh, supportive policies, but that's certainly a, a big part of what makes uh, community gardens go round. Uh, education and skills, again, another really important piece for us that really uh, helps to improve uh, food access, uh, community relationships, connectedness, and just overall uh, community as a whole, and of course to have fun. So how did this seed get planted? I talked a little bit about kind of a conversation that happened uh, in our own home that uh, aligned nicely with our involvement with uh, Transition Mankato. So for those of you who maybe have some familiarity, transition, uh, the movement of transition really comes out of the UK and really was focused in on 
uh, moving away from peak oil dependency, our dependency on fossil fuels, and really focuses in on community resiliency. So out of a group that was formed after an Earth Conference hosted here in Mankato, a steering committee was uh, developed and uh, actually went through the process of becoming a transition town in the United States. And as you can see there, Mankato is the 149th transition town in the United States, which is pretty exciting for us. Uh, so a part of transition really focuses in on the heart and soul movement. Uh, in my day job, I'm a clinical therapist, and so I'm certainly interested in the psychological impact that cl climate change has on, on folks. And so that's really the heart piece. Uh, we often joke that I'm the heart piece and uh, Ryan is the, the soil piece, although we, we definitely uh, pass those roles back and forth. Uh, so uh, Mary already touched on the importance of a needs assessment. We looked at our community and then had an opportunity to host a visioning session that uh, allowed for folks to come together and really identify what are their, what are the needs that we have in our community? What is it that we want to see? Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with urban chicken movements. Uh, that certainly was something that came up here, but community gardens really floated to the top. Access to healthy food uh, and uh, educational opportunities around learning skills. And so, it was a wonderful opportunity to kind of take that and run with it, and thus began the process of really continuing to plot. Then we had an opportunity to host a sustainability expo, and at that uh, expo, we had a guest speaker from the city of Mankato, John Nurnberg, who was the city planner who was talking about our sustainability plan here in Mankato. And it came to our attention that perhaps it would be advantageous to chat with him uh, after his presentation and say, hey, you know, we're interested in sustainability efforts. And thus began a really great conversation about uh, how the city could support our community garden efforts. And that's one of the pieces that I would really highlight is to meet with your uh, city council, meet with uh, planners meet with whomever who's involved in the city and county level to talk about what are some of those things that are in place for sustainability. It's a really good place to start, but it's also a little bit of a you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours, because uh, I'll get to this piece, but then, then came the opportunity for the land that I'll talk about. So we had this opportunity to get involved with the city planner, and uh, thus began a lot of meetings. We developed a heart and soil advisory uh, council, which uh, involves a number of folks from different sectors in the town of Mankato. And uh, that allowed for us to do some planning and then of course to present to our city, city council. So you can see there, there's a number of folks, and of course I didn't capture them all, the slide's not quite big enough to get everybody on there, but you can see that we have a number of people involved in these efforts. And that's been really a key piece, is getting partnerships uh, through uh, various, various uh, places. Uh, the School Sisters of Notre Dame, their uh, Center for Earth Spirituality and Rural Ministry, uh, because Heart and Soil is not yet a nonprofit, a 501c3 themselves. We have a fiscal sponsor, and that also plays a role in our liability insurance. We were able to be an add-on to their uh, insurance plan, and that took a variety of conversations, but that's been an important, uh, an important part. Uh, the city uh, really supports us in the efforts. Uh, they're the ones actually who provided us the land that Heart and Soil is on. They've actually also provided us the water source. We were able to tap the meter, and we partnered with Green Care, which is a local uh, green and grounds uh, uh, business, and they were actually able to set up the water maintenance for us. And then uh, our original funding really came out of the Blue Earth County Health, uh, State Health Improvement Partnership, or the SHIP uh, project. And so uh, that certainly has been important. So we've got all of these connections uh, kind of across, across greater, greater Mankato. 
of course, our neighborhood association was a key piece as far as talking with folks about, hey, we want to put this garden in, how do folks feel about it? Many of those folks were also invited to our visioning session. And then, of course, we've done a number of presentations to that group as well, and they've been very supportive. Uh, we've also partnered with the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. They've helped do gardening. Uh, an Eagle Scout project was actually our signage and then our compost bins. And so that was a really great opportunity to connect with a young person and get them, them really excited about community gardening. And then we actually have a bike polo club. Uh, right where our garden is located, we have a um, hockey rink. So it's just the asphalt during the summer months. And so uh, those folks went in with us uh, with some of their money to help build a, a storage shed that is accessible for both Heart and Soil members and then the bike polo folks as well. So the dream is to have 20 gardens in 20 neighborhoods in Mankato by 2020. It seems a little lofty, perhaps, but part of the loftiness is that we actually already have several of those gardens in place. So we're just, uh, like many of us do, building on the shoulders of those who've come before us. But uh, as far as heart and soil gardens, the pilot garden that I'll be talking most about uh, is the first of its kind uh, in the Mankato uh, area that's not connected with the Good Council Gardens, which is the oldest community garden system in Mankato. And so really focusing in on, again, those community connections, relationship building, sustainable food access, and then, of course, increasing skills and knowledge as well. So uh, I know Leoma already touched on this and Mary as well, but why community gardens? We know folks eat better when they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, they're also exercising and we know you feel better, whether that's physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, when you're in the garden, but also connecting with others. Uh, crime prevention and youth engagement. This sometimes comes up when folks say, well, what if uh, people you know, take from the gardens or engage in uh, you know, damaging the property in some way, but really the research and our own anecdotal experience demonstrates that that's not been the case. We've lost a couple tomatoes, but we've uh, really talked with the gardeners about recognizing that perhaps folks needed those more than even you did. Uh, of course, our urban ecosystem, our garden is located at a beautiful intersection uh, by our high school and then some baseball uh, fields, and it's a high traffic area, so you will uh, have lots of folks uh, able to access and see the garden as well, which has just been just been really great. And then, of course, the cultural and, and connection opportunities. Uh, we have a number of folks who are from the refugee and immigrant community uh, who have been really wonderful in talking about uh, different ways of gardening, uh, talking about different kinds of seeds that they had planted previously, uh, different techniques, which has just been a really powerful experience in building relationships, but also knowledge between folks as well. So how to get growing. I know Mary touched on a number of these, but I'll just give a couple little examples from Heart and Soil's experience. So land. This comes up all of the time in our conversations uh, as far as, you know, what, what, what makes sense for land, where to have land, you know, kind of finding land, et cetera. You know, we really uh, were pretty lucky in that the spot that we had identified happened to be the exact spot that the city of Mankato had identified for the garden. So that really uh, allowed for us to have some really good conversations back and forth about uh, using that space, uh, kind of the time frame. Uh, that we would have the gardens there and how to go about making the best use of that. Another issue that was already identified with uh, land in particular is uh, the health of the soil. Uh, so we uh, did soil testing through the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, and I should note that many of the things that we needed to uh, pay for were grant supported. And I will get to some of the other ways we support the gardens now. Uh, but certainly uh, checking the soil, you know, one of the spots that has been identified for one of our next gardens we know is a, is a snow removal drop site. Well, you know what 
probably comes in all the snow, all that salt and all the stuff they put on the, on the roads. So we are thinking about probably only raised beds in those garden spots. Uh, and then, of course, sunlight, we talked about this. Uh, access to wood chips, that was something that the city provided us uh, for no cost. Uh, water, uh, certainly a big part to consider and think about how are you going to have access to that. We do have a shed, we've talked about rain barrel runoff, but as the seasons have gone, we certainly have not gotten enough rain to support our garden. Uh, and then compost and dirt source, certainly being thoughtful about where, if you're needing to get dirt in, that it's coming from compost. We have a number of farms. There's a, a composting site here in Mankato called Full Circle that we've uh, done some partnering with who's provided some of that compost. And then the storage shed, uh, part of transition is tool sharing. So one of the things we've made available uh, to folks is to be able to share those tools, rent them out, use them as needed, and then return them. And then how do you gather gardeners? Uh, word of mouth is powerful, but we have a Facebook group. We've had a number of meetings actually at our home where we've hosted people. Uh, certainly the involvement from the county and the city has really helped to drum up business. We have folks who gardened with us who go out and uh, put out flyers. So it's really a community effort all the way around. So you can see there that a couple uh, pictures of our, our Heart and Soil Garden uh, pilot garden, we still refer to it as our, our garden pilot. Our signage, uh, similarly to what Mary said, you do have to be thoughtful about uh, the requirements and policies around the signage. We're in a high traffic area, so the signage had to be uh, positioned in a certain way so we weren't blocking anyone from being able to see other drivers as they were coming up to the stop sign. Uh, and so far, we haven't caused any accidents from gawking, <laughs> but you know, certainly something to something to consider. You can see our compost bins there, and then our garden beds as well. Uh, Heart and Soil uh, has each uh, gardener has their own plot. Uh, one of the things that happens in side by side gardening uh, is that looks different than the way that we have our garden plots set up. We have 21 in bed, in ground gardens and then we have four standing gardens as well. One of the things that we were really thoughtful about was ADA uh, uh, requirements, making sure that people could access them if they were wheelchair bound, for example, if maybe they had chronic pain. And so we've had a number of gardeners who've been able to garden who maybe would not otherwise be able to garden. So successes, I think that our biggest success has just been our, our community support. Uh, we have had a, uh, a, our mayor declared Community Garden Day here in Mankato as well. So we had folks who were really supportive of our efforts. Uh, we've hosted Community Gardening Day where we've been down at the gardens and, and have had people stop by and learn about our gardens. Uh, we partner with other community gardens so that we're, uh, you know, thoughtful if we couldn't get someone in our garden, that we would certainly be able to pass along their information and get another garden uh, set up for them. One of the things that we've wanted to do with our Seeds of, our, sorry, seeds of Significance uh, for Heart and Soil's vision is to almost have a, a Heart and Soil stamp of approval in the garden. So that would mean you're following those expectations laid out by Heart and Soil. So we're not using any material that is, um, we, we want to use organic material. We want to, you know, be thoughtful about the plants that we're growing. We're not using harsh pesticides. Uh, and so really being thoughtful about those efforts. And then policies that apply, you can see there in our gardening agreement, you know, not using tobacco, you're not growing illegal plants in your garden, some of those kinds of things that really are important. And I wouldn't have necessarily thought about until uh, we had to put that together. So those partnerships, I touched on a number of those. Uh, and then I just really think highlighting the gardeners is such a really wonderful thing too. We've had a number of different kinds of folks involved in the gardeners. And uh, one of the, I guess, greatest successes has been a gardener who uh, is originally from Kenya. And she had told me she just loves driving by the garden. 
uh, she said that when she sees her garden, it's like going home. And that, for me, has been the greatest success because that's really what our community gardens should uh, really highlight for folks. So with success does some, come some challenges. Uh, anyone who's ever gardened knows that you're kind of at the, the will of the weather, the creatures that live in the area, uh, some of the things that kind of come up around that. I will uh, touch on sustainability because I certainly think that uh, grant efforts often get things off the ground but don't necessarily support them uh, long term. And so that's an area that we're uh, continuing to look at in grant writing, um, you know, becoming a 501c3, looking at, you know, who will be our fiscal sponsor in the meantime, some of those parts, because a lot of that has been in kind, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, the changes in roles, uh, the city planner who I mentioned before changed, you know, that was a bit of a challenge, but the new person in has been really supportive of the garden. Uh, our neighborhood association in Lincoln Park had uh, received some grant funding for green spaces, and so we had to uh, make a case for heart and soil, even though they had been supportive, that was something we needed to follow up and, and talk with them about. Um, so those are some of the really, uh, you know, important parts as we're moving forward. So future plotting, uh, we, I just highlighted here, we have a reskilling festival happening here this coming weekend. So Heart and Soil is actively involved in things across the greater Mankato area. We're talking about uh, starting seeds inside, uh, preparing for uh, spring crops, et cetera. We're going to work on building little free markets. As some of you might be familiar with the uh, little free libraries, they're similar but they are going to be posted at our community garden site so that folks can access. If you've got an extra tomato or cucumber, you can put them in there and, and people can access that. I should note that some of our garden produce also goes to our Echo Food Shelf. We have a partnership with the Blue Earth County Farm, which is a hunger farm here in town. And so we try to make sure that folks have access to food as well. Uh, we'll be meeting with Habitat for Humanity. One of the efforts that Heart and Soil is working on is that the houses that are being built through Habitat would have uh, raised beds as just part of their plan as well. So folks are already set up to have a garden available along with their home. Of course, getting ready for our 2017 season and then grant writing and research, researching continued sites. So certainly uh, I've included our information there as far as contacts. You are more than welcome wherever you are in the world to join our Facebook group. We'd love to have, uh, it's a great way for sharing with uh, different uh, folks all over. Uh, we also have our email there. You're certainly welcome after this uh, webinar. If we didn't get to any of your questions, you can certainly email, email me. I would love that. And I think we're always, we're in it together and we're growing together. And uh, Audrey Hepburn said it best when she said to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. So with that, I will hand things back over to Leoma and we will, I think, get to your questions. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, before we move to questions, I'd like to highlight um, a few resources that you can find on the Public Health Law Center's uh, Healthy Eating website under Gardens. On the slide is also a link to the center's resource on liability protection for food donation. Uh, we will also have the new and improved Community Garden Policy Reference Guide that will be coming soon. We will uh, send out an announcement to all our webinar registrants when um, the resource has been published. And now we will move to questions. Um, and Erica, we have a question for you. Um, in the current body of knowledge around community gardens and local governments, there seems to be a large emphasis on urban gardening. How can mm -hmm. lessons learned from the urban community gardening movement be translated to rural communities? I think that's a really great question. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot, 
I, I really like the, the dance between urban and rural gardening. Uh, you know, I certainly think in urban spaces, there's a lot of things that show up differently. You have to be thoughtful about space. Um, so uh, some of the techniques maybe that we've used in some of the rural settings like vertical gardening, uh, being really thoughtful. I know we talked about sunlight, you know, certainly there are a lot of pieces that impact that, uh, you know, that, that I think that, you know, we can kind of take from, uh, you know, each of those and really be thoughtful about kind of how, how they look very similar and in some, some areas how they look very different from one another. Um, I will, uh, there's a resource that I'm thinking about that really, uh, you know, captures that well, and I cannot remember it off the top of my head, but I will get that and I will, I will send that out somehow to the group if that would work. Erica, that's great. This is Mary. Um, we can, if you share that resource with us, we'll make sure to send it to all the webinar participants. Sounds good. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that, um, from you know, thinking about more urban or densely populated areas and more rural areas, is that while you know the gardening efforts may look a little bit different because of land access and and population density, one of the things that we found and that we really highlight in the community garden policy guide is a range of um, community sizes where um, garden activities have been happening and where local governments have supported the gardening activity. So, for example, I mean, I was really impressed where some smaller communities in greater Minnesota, you know, really have a nice partnership with the local government around um, the provision of some technical assistance, um, working to make water access um, a feasible option for the garden. And, and so I think that, that some of the the issues may be different depending on the size of the community, but um, as we, we've really tried to highlight a range of different community experiences in the guide because it, um, gardens um, are meaningful opportunities regardless of where you live. And, and I think that from a healthy food access perspective in particular, one of the things that I have a growing appreciation for is that how um, fresh produce can be really hard to access in more rural communities, even in some of our farming and agricultural communities, and I think that community garden spaces can be a really, really critical asset um, and resource for communities to be able to access healthier food. Thanks, Erica and Mary. Um, and now we have another question, um, and it's about what differences have you seen between community gardens and school gardens? Erica or Mary, would you like to respond to that? So Erica, why don't I take a first stab at this and then you can let me know if you have other experience. I, I have worked a fair amount with school gardening efforts. Actually, just uh, about a week and a half ago, we had our annual schoolyard garden conference here in Minnesota. And one of the things I think that I, a difference might be that um, school gardens oftentimes, um, you know, straddle that line between educational purposes and also um, providing some food access. But it can be hard for school gardens, just from a capacity perspective, to have enough land to actually produce a food to feed, you know, children regularly. Now, I can say, make a caveat, in some urban, I mean, I'm sorry, in some more rural areas, there are some more school farm models that are evolving, and so I know that some um, more rural schools may have more production school gardens, but in, in in other urban areas, I think school gardens often are more of an educational tool than a production. I think I would just echo the same thing, Mary. That's what I've seen. Uh, and I think about, uh, particularly in this area, uh, one of the high schools uh, has the ability to produce a fair amount of the food that's used in the school. But again, that happens because of uh, uh, access to a much a more significant amount of land. Uh, so in the school system, though, I think using them much more for education, uh, which has been just really fantastic, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and then we also have another question about how can economic developers be integrated into community gardening and policy studies? Erica, would you like to respond to that first? Sure, I certainly can do that. I think that uh, those folks are a really important part of 
that whole process. And I think integrating them from the very beginning, um, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations about uh, the impact that uh, community gardens, urban agriculture, all of those pieces have on our economics, uh, community, and I think having their voice at the table is just imperative and I would just encourage that from the get-go. Get everyone at the table, even the folks you wouldn't think about uh, that uh, really might have a different perspective or bring, bring something in. Yeah, you know, I'd also like to just add to that, that one of the things that we have seen in some of the research is um, the potential impact that having gardens um, can have on property values. And this can be a good thing. Um, there's been a relationship that's been identified between gardening and, and green spaces and, and um, higher property values. And at the same time, I think that there's an equity consideration that needs to be um, con um, taken into account to make sure that um, the existing population is not negatively impacted by or displaced because of gentrification or some of the increased property values. And that's, I think, going back to what, you know, Erica, you were just saying too, is just how important it is to have the community involved and really have community participation um, so that if those um, things start to develop, that there's a way to respond um, so that the, the current community members are not negatively impacted. Thank you. Um, and Mary, can you talk a little bit more about um, donating garden produce and any liability concerns around donating produce from a garden? Sure. Um, there are, I mean, we've received a number of questions at the Public Health Law Center about liability issues in donating food. And, and I will say that the um, resource that Leoma mentioned earlier the, that's on our website, food, um, liability protection for food donation, should um, respond to those concerns. There is a really broad um, liability protection under both federal and state. Most states have a similar law. Um, the federal law is the Good Samaritan Food Donation Law, and um, I know Minnesota has a, a similar law. But basically, as long as food is donated in good faith and, and the person who's donating the food to a charitable organization um, has no reason to believe that there's anything wrong with the food, then even if, if if someone gets sick um, from the food that's donated, the person who donates the food is not legally liable for that. And, and the reality is, is that you know any food that's donated from a garden, I mean there needs to be proper food handling, you know, from the recipient, as far as washing the food and preparing the food. And so it is something that um, you know if if for example you're donating food to a food shelf or other social service agency just to make sure that people understand that this is food coming from a garden and needs to be handled um, appropriately. Thank you. Um, and then Erica, uh, can you talk about um, like the pros and cons of a community garden having a 501c3 nonprofit status? Sure. Well, you know, that's a <laughs> that's some somewhat of a, a big question perhaps, you know, because Part of it is I'm doing some research uh, has really been, you know, the, the biggest push for us around the status piece has been uh, being able to write grants for uh, Heart and Soil. We've had a really phenomenal uh, fiscal sponsor in the Center for Earth Spirituality and Rural Ministry, uh, but there's been um, some changes there that uh, I think will, you know, maybe uh, invite this push for us to look at this as a possibility. Uh, you know, my, my preference would perhaps be to just kind of remain grassroots effort, but uh, that's not quite the way that all of the grant writing works. And so that's the biggest part that I think is the is a pro. Um, you know, certainly there are, are lots of um, parts that go along with that, paperwork, et cetera. Um, but I'm, you know, really just doing a lot of research on that right now, so I don't have my pro and con list quite nailed down. but. Um, you know, if folks have <laughs> things that have um, been really successful in that process, I'd love to hear that too. Email that to me. <laughs> Erica, that's a, I appreciate that you're in the middle of kind of figuring that out. Um, another resource that I have found really helpful is the Minnesota non um, Council of Nonprofits. Um, on their website, they actually have um, 
some really great information about kind of assessing the pros and cons about becoming a 501c3 federal nonprofit or um, becoming a nonprofit under Minnesota law, which are different, actually, and, um, and I have found some of their resources to be really helpful. Okay, thank you, Mary. And I think we have some time for maybe one more question. Um, are there any resources or programs available for immigrant communities um, around community gardening in urban areas? Uh, Mary or Erica, would you like to respond to that? Mary, do you, you know, well, I'm, I'm thinking about, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Erica. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, the, the Gardening Matters resources, They, uh, even though they're kind of taking a little bit of a hibernation, the resources are still available online. That's a really phenomenal resource that's here available here in Minnesota, um, but anyone can access it online. Um, I, I, I recall there being some good information there, uh, but as far as kind of maybe other information, maybe I defer to you, Mary, a little bit on that. No, I, I think that the um that making gardens accessible to new immigrants and, and different parts of our population is a really important consideration and you know from making information accessible from a language perspective, um, from training. I know that that there are efforts uh, for example, as part of my work with the Minnesota Extension Services Master Gardening Program that there's some efforts to really do outreach to the Latino population and um, try to um, provide community gardening opportunities in different um, areas where there may be different immigrant groups um, that have a higher population there. So I, so I would say that Extension Services and the Master Gardening Program probably has some resources available there. And there are some other, I think there's an American Community Gardening <coughs> Association that also has some resources about different um, gardening opportunities and how to, um, to provide services to a wide range of, of community members who may be interested. Great. Um, I want to say a big thank you to our presenters, Mary Marrow and Erica Ipso, for sharing uh, your expertise and insight during our webinar today. And um, here is the contact information uh, for our speakers. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect with them directly, you can reach out using the contact information on this slide. Also, a reminder that the recording of this webinar will be sent out within the next few days, and we will also be sending an announcement when the resource is published. Thank you again for joining us, and have a wonderful rest of your day.